Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ethics Signal Series. I'm John, the Signal Coordinator. And together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley. Kathy and I will be the moderator. We have our speaker, Tom Carson, with us. Uh, he is from GFDL and Princeton. A few things before we start up. You can always find out our seminar schedule on our site, go.umd.edu slash seminar. The seminar is being recorded, including both the presentation and questions. We will put the recording on Ethics YouTube channel. The agenda is end. First, let the speaker do his presentation and then do the questions. You are welcome to bring up any questions. You can ask a vocal question. Just click on the raise hand button on your right, and then we will unmute you. And also withdraw the request by clicking the lower hand button. You can send us a text message uh, through the chat, and we will bring up your questions to the presenter. Let me first give a brief introduction about speaker before he starts. So Tom Larson is a climate scientist with the NOAA GFDL in Princeton, New Jersey, where he leads the Weather and Climate Dynamics TV. He's a fellow of AMS and has served as the chair of World Meteorological Organization's expert team on tropical cyclones and climate change. He led a recent assessment on tropical cyclones and climate change, which was published in in 2019. He was the lead author of the chapter on detection and attribution of climate change in the US Climate Science Special Report. His research has been on detecting human influence on regional precipitation and atmospheric circulation trends. Let's welcome the speaker. And now I will give the ball to Tom. Tom. Okay, well, thank you, John. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to present this um, uh, material today. This will be covering some things that I've been involved with over the past few years. And the common thread that runs through it is that um, I've been looking a lot at different regional aspects of of climate change, things which are associated with global warming. And the title here is it's tough regional climate change problems, uh, detection and attribution and projections for three different types of, of uh, weather and climate events, hurricanes, uh, mean precipitation and sea level pressure trends. And um, so what uh, what motivates this work is that uh, when we look at things like uh, global mean temperature, we have a very clear signal in observations that um, observe global temperatures are rising. And this uh, rise in uh, global temperatures is unusual compared to uh, expected natural variability here, as we uh, see in the right hand figure. The, observation sort of sticking out of the background of natural variability. So uh, we refer to this as a detectable change when the observed change is highly unusual compared to uh, natural variability, at least as simulated by uh, the, uh, the climate models. Uh, at the same time, we, we then can compare the observed global mean temperature to the uh, a, a, another set of climate model runs, which include all forcings, they include natural forcings as well as anthropogenic forcings. And that's over here on the left, this orange shaded region. And we see that um, observations are consistent with the all forcing uh, scenarios. So uh, this situation where we have a detectable uh, change, but it's consistent with uh, models once you add in the anthropogenic forcings, then leads us to make fairly, uh, a very strong statements about um, detection and attribution of climate change, at least in terms of global mean temperature. But uh, climate involves much more than global mean temperature. And so how are other things changing? Things like tropical cyclones, precipitation on regional scales, things like that. How, how would we expect these things to change in the future? 
Um, and the reason why we're so interested in this, uh, uh, looking at the, at the past uh, for these other uh, types of phenomena is that how do we get, how do we gain confidence in our future projections of, of any type of uh, phenomena? You can always look at climate models and just take their projections at face value. You, it's possible to, to look at climate models and see how they're projecting regional changes in precipitation or sea level pressure or even tropical cyclones in a relatively new uh, area. But can we believe those projections? And I, I would submit that uh, you have higher confidence in a future projection in cases where you already uh, have see a detectable change in observations as we do for global mean temperature. So we have greater confidence in a projection when we, we have a detectable change already, a detectable change which is consistent uh, with what we're ex expecting uh, based on uh, model historical runs. On the other hand, if the observations are either, if the observed changes are either not detectable or let's say that the observed changes are different from the model, so they don't really follow what the models say should have happened over the historical period, then we would have less, tend to have less confidence in those projections. So this is the type of question that we're asking. Here I'm showing it for global mean temperature, but you can ask the same set of questions, even at the regional scale, for some other metric like precipitation or sea level pressure and so forth. Not just global average, but also at the regional scale. You can ask these same questions. Is the change detectable? Is it consistent with all forcing? Is there a problem of consistency between observations and models? So that's what we're doing. That's the approach we're uh, taking to look at regional uh, climate changes and um, in the past and in order to gain some insight about the reliability of future projections in those changes. So that's sort of the theme of this talk. Uh, this is another way of looking at the warming, global warming, and these orange curves are uh, represent uh, are showing 24,000 years of, of uh, internal variability as simulated by climate models. So you see how unusual the global warming is compared to internal simulated variability. Uh, this doesn't mean that we're absolutely sure that this is not uh, natural because this we have some, um, there's uncertainty about how much um, internal vari multi-decadal variability there is in the climate system. Um, However, CMIP-5 models are not able to simulate any global mean changes anywhere close to the magnitude uh, that we're seeing uh, in observations, which is one of the lines of evidence, one of the reasons why um, we conclude that it's very likely that, or extremely likely that most of the warming since the uh, 1950 or so is uh, due to anthropogenic forcing as opposed to uh, just natural variability. Okay, but what about these other other phenomena like tropical cyclones? So I did, as mentioned, John mentioned, I did lead an assessment on this, which was published. The first part of this assessment was just published this uh, past October, and this was a team effort. I show the team members here. It was organized by the WMO uh, as a task team to look at tropical cyclones and climate change. So these are the members, I'm sort of speaking for the members of this team and, and going and reviewing the state. So we looked at tropical cyclones to see, uh, first of all, whether there was evidence that tropical cyclones were changing in a way that was unusual compared to expected uh, natural variability. So uh, this is an update of an older figure uh, on this for the Atlantic Basin. Uh, this. An important curve here is uh, well, the top curve is global mean temperature, and then we have tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature. The blue curve here is raw hurricane counts in the Atlantic basin. Uh, and then the orange curve is U.S. landfalling hurricanes. So we see that U.S. landfalling hurricanes has no real long-term trend over time, in contrast to global mean temperature or tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature. Now, hurricanes in the Atlantic Overall, the basin-wide count does have a rising trend over time. But Gabe Vecchi and I have done some work looking at the uh, observing, uh, the ability to actually detect tropical cyclones, especially back in the pre-satellite era. And we do think that it's very likely that there were missed, uh, uh, quite a few missed storms back in the earlier part of the record. 
And this is our attempt at an adjusted hurricane count record where we adjust for this lack of observations in the earlier part of the record. And we see with the adjusted record, there's more of a, uh, it looks more like U.S. landfalling hurricanes. There's no real uh, strong trend. So U.S. landfalling hurricanes, no real uh, evidence for a century scale trend at this, at this point. Um, there is multi-decadal variability, however, in the uh, in the Atlantic hurricane record, and this is some work uh, uh, with Rong Zong and Zhao Chen Yan and I uh, did a few years ago. But this is just showing the multi-decadal variability of major hurricane counts in the Atlantic Basin, the shaded number, and we see how uh, we also plotted uh, a couple of other indices in the Atlantic Basin, including a uh, an index of vertical wind shear here in red, which you see correlates very well with major hurricane counts in the Atlantic. And the question is, uh, what's causing these multi-decadal variations? And there are a couple of uh, leading candidates for that. One is that aerosol forcing uh, was strong during this sort of quiet period, which caused the Atlantic to be unusually cool. Uh, and then as we clean, as the uh, uh, did the Clean Air Act and so forth in the 1970s, aerosol forcing became less, and we had some, some sort of uh, uh, warming and increased hurricane uh, activity during that period. But we also think that this multi-decadal swing could have a large natural variability, internal variability component too, uh, because for instance, there's some evidence now that the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation has actually been weakening a bit uh, since 2003, as we show here. And also, the uh, while there have been a lot of major hurricanes in the Atlantic, uh, not as many as around uh, the uh, 2005 era. So there does seem to be um, a little uh, some correspondence between this uh, Atlantic uh, reduction in Atlantic overturning circulation and and decreasing hurricane major hurricane counts on a decadal scale in the Atlantic, which is suggesting that maybe it's not, uh, maybe aerosols are not the major player. It could be internal variability in the Atlantic uh, radiana overturning circulation playing a big role here. Anyway, that's, um, that's just for the Atlantic. Here are some time series, some of the longest time series we have of tropical cyclone activity around the globe. So this is where we really try to stretch it back in time. So this, this middle curve here is U.S. landfalling hurricane counts, again, which I showed earlier, no real trend over time in that. Same for uh, TC landfalls in Japan. A severe landfalling TCs in Eastern Australia has a slight, it's statistically significant, slight negative trend. Um, there's some evidence uh, for uh, a rise in uh, U.S. surge activity, at least since since 1940 here in this index. But we also, this is from Grinstead et al.'s uh, paper, but it was also rather large back uh, in, the, in the 1930s. Um, so we did not conclude that there was any evidence for detectable anthropogenic influence in any of these uh, long-term indices. Um, we did conclude that there, there did seem to be at least a detectable change, something unusual compared to natural variability in this reduction in Eastern Australia, severe landfalling TC. So these longest time series are not really showing anything like global temperature for tropical cyclones. Uh, and these are global tropical cyclone frequency records. So these are the total number of storms in black and total number of hurricane strength storms in red. No real trend in either of these. Uh, the same for landfalling TCs, no statistically significant trends in uh, total landfalling TCs or category three, four, five TCs, uh, some work done by um, Michael et al. on this. So again, not a lot of evidence for big changes in tropical cyclones, at least based on these records. Um, there are a few, some other metrics, some other tropical cyclone metrics, which are beginning to suggest some changes. This is a uh, tropical cyclone maximum intensity globally and in different basins. These are showing the time series <clears throat> since the early 1980s. This is using a satellite based 
intensity record uh, work done by Jim Carson and collaborators. Uh, so they use the satellite based record to try to make sure that they have a relatively consistent and homogeneous record over time, something which is more homogeneous than the sort of conventional best track record. So this is using a special, specially designed satellite based data set for trend analysis. And what it shows is an in strongest increase in the North Atlantic, uh, but mixed behavior elsewhere, a slight decrease in the East Pacific and so forth. The global has a very uh, slight increasing trend. It was significant at the 0.1 value. So here, uh, again, we're not concluding that there's a uh, strong evidence for a detectable trend. Uh, we instead conclude that there's a, a balance of evidence if you um, look at different uh, uh, different aspects of the problem, we'd say there's a balance of evidence. So we're not really saying that we're even medium confident in a detectable trend at this point in a detectable increase. But uh, but there's some indication, a suggestion at least, of an increase um, at the global scale. But it's very mixed, and a lot of it seems to be coming out of the North Atlantic Basin, uh, whereas I mentioned before, uh, that may be related to the reduction in aerosol uh, forcing. Or, uh, or natural internal variability. So that basin is sort of special in terms of the large multi-decadal variability going on. By the way, uh, John, are you still able to hear me? I want to make sure we don't lose the connection. Yes. Okay, thank you. Good. Yeah. So um, this was the strongest statement we made in our assessment about tropical cyclones and climate change. And it was based on some work done by Jim Carson showing that there's been a poleward shift in the latitude of maximum intensities in the Western North Pacific Basin. Uh, and this is based on data going back into the 1940s, where they're just looking at where the tropical cyclones uh, reached their maximum intensity, not what the maximum intensity was. So we think that's more likely to be a uh, relatively homogeneous record over time. And it does show an increasing uh, trend over time, uh, sort of marginally, statistically uh, significant, uh, now, Jim uh, then uh, wanted to take out the effects of natural variability as best he could, so he used linear regression to remove ENSO and to remove an estimate of the PDO, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, from this time series. So when he regresses out the PDO and ENSO, he gets this uh, residual time series here shown in this bottom right figure, which actually has a more significant uh, rising uh, trend than the original data. So that is to say that doesn't that the uh, behavior in the original data, the rising trend there does not seem to be due uh, to the PDO and ENSO. In fact, uh, if anything, those seem to be perhaps suppressing the trend according to this uh, linear trend regression analysis. Now, this is the expectation of how this metric, how we expect this to change going forward based on uh, climate model simulations. So there is an expectation going forward that this will increase, that there will continue to be a poleward shift. However, uh, this trend was not significant in model historical runs. It's only significant in the projection runs. So here we had uh, low to medium competence that there's actually a detectable, which means unusual compared to natural variability, change in the latitude of maximum intensity. But we're not yet attributing it, attributing it uh, at this level to anthropogenic forcing because while we while we expect that to be the signal going forward in the future, the historical runs, which I'm not showing here, did not show a significant uh, change over the historical period. It was small, I think it was positive, but it just wasn't significant. That was the strongest statement we made in the report. We also made a statement about the global proportion of tropical cyclones reaching category four or five levels because that has also increased uh, significantly in observed data sets. By significant, I mean it's significant uh, based on some type of linear trend analysis. Uh, and so I especially want to draw your attention to the bottom figure here, which is based on the HERSAT. So this is the satellite-based intensity record. And going back into the uh, early 1980s uh, and forward, this is some work uh, of uh, Jim Cosson uh, brought to the committee. I think he has a paper coming out on this uh, soon, but I don't want to uh, 
say any more about that. It's still uh, still in press. Uh, but based on Jim's uh, preliminary analysis shown here, we do see a significant increase in category four or five proportion. But we're not ready to conclude yet that this is a detectable signal with any uh, degree of confidence because the uh, right now all we have is a significant linear trend over a certain time period. We don't really know what the characteristics of natural variability are uh, for this type of metric. One way of, of assessing that is to actually look at it in say a long control runs like we did for global mean temperature, but that hasn't been done yet. It's much more difficult to look at a metric like this in climate models. Most climate models don't even simulate anything like category four or five storms to begin with. So there are some technical problems with actually trying to uh, estimate how much natural variability there is in this metric from climate models. But I think there will be more uh, work on that uh, going forward in the future. So at this point, we're just saying there's a balance of evidence that there's a, some type of global detectable anthropogenic increase. I say anthropogenic here because we do expect this metric to actually increase based on, a, based on our climate model simu, uh, simulations of tropical cyclone activity. So here's one where we, uh, we're, we're making a, uh, a balance of evidence statement. Um, this is some work done by Kieran Batia. I participated on this paper. It was looking at, at rapid intensification ratios so that how often we're getting rapid intensification in the Atlantic Basin. And the, the data are shown here uh, in the, for, uh, the Atlantic Basin, both for the best track uh, type data and for the HERSAT uh, satellite-based data, which are in agreement there that there's been an increase in the uh, rapid intensification cases, the fraction of storms which undergo rapid intensification in the Atlantic Basin since the early 1980s. Here, we actually did try to assess this trend compared to simulated trends in models. So uh, the value of this uh, observed trend is uh, here, is this dashed line going across here for IB tracks and Verset, both pretty similar. And this uh, bar whisker diagram is a distribution of trends in long control runs of the GFDL high floor model, which is a model which is a, actually able to simulate very intense uh, storms. So the high floor model has um, the high floor um, the high floor model has um, some internally generated trends, which are actually uh, even a little bit larger than the observed trend. But I think the observed trend is at about the um, uh, I think it's about the 98th percentile. So the observed trend is very unusual compared to the internally generated trend in the high flow model. Now, this is just one model, and there is uncertainty as to how much internal variability there is in the Atlantic. But this is an illustration of how we can begin to use climate models to look for detectable, uh, detectable trends. And in this case, the, at least the high floor model is saying that this increase in rapid intensification ratio is unusual compared to what we would expect from natural variability, at least uh, in the high floor model. And again, simulations of natural multi-decadal variability in the Atlantic are uh, still somewhat um, uncertain. It's still an active area of research, so we don't want to make a very strong conclusion about it based on this one model at this time. I've been talking a little bit about type of balance of evidence, uh, types of statements and so forth. And where does that come from? Uh, well, when we uh, typically have done these assessments in the past, we've done what you, we've uh, tried to avoid the type one uh, error when we're talking about the detection of anthropogenic influence on various things. Uh, that would be an error where we claim that something is the case, but it's actually not the case. So we've overstated something. So we try to avoid overstating the case by having a relatively strong criteria before we say we have medium confidence in something. We might uh, say that we need to have strong, a very good physical understanding of the, of the uh, process and process understanding of why the change is going on in models and in observations. We might require that it be strong agreement between models, so use multi-models to look for how much uh, agreement there is between models. Uh, we might also require there to be a really strong signal, something 
much more significant than say the 0.05 level. So there are different ways of, uh, of, of um, sort of raising the bar so that you're less likely to falsely conclude that there's some type of anthropogenic influence. On the other hand, suppose that you, instead of wanting to avoid overstating the case, say that you want to avoid understating the case. So you don't want to miss anthropogenic influences if there is something going on in the data. So that's what, if we understate uh, anthropogenic influence on something and it's actually going on, that would be a type two error. So um, this Lloyd and Oreskes paper sort of points out that you have these two different ways of looking at the issue. And so maybe uh, depending on what your audience is, maybe it's a type of, in a scientific audience, you may be more concerned with avoiding type one error and being sort of conservative on the, uh, but if you're uh, someone who's doing, um, uh, say, risk assessment at the coast, you may want to uh, really avoid type two error. If there is some kind of change going on, you really want to be aware of it. So, so therefore, we, we decided to look at all these uh, examples in the literature from both the type trying to avoid type one error and trying to avoid type two error. Uh, to avoid type two error, we said, well, let's just lower the bar down instead of having a very st strong criteria. Let's just uh, look for a balance of evidence that there's some type of uh, change which is outside natural variability or a balance of evidence that there's some anthropogenic influence. So that's a, a much lower sort of criterion. So we're gonna end up with more speculative statements, but this is in the spirit of trying to avoid overstating human influence. So this is just which which type of, of area you are avoiding. This is more of a policy or audience uh, uh, based question. So, okay, so this was what uh, the summary of what the uh, the panel des, uh, decided looking at all the published literature on tropical cyclones and climate change, at least for detectable changes. So uh, using this type one error approach, as I mentioned, the one change we've saw that we had low to medium confidence in, so this was the strongest statement we made, was for this observed poleward migration of the latitude of maximum intensity. There was eight out of 11 authors uh, had that, uh, at least that level of confidence, but we had low confidence in any other observed, that any other tropical cyclone changes represented detectable or attributable changes. That was from a type one error avoidance perspective. From a type two error avoidance perspective, if we, um, Here's where we're trying to avoid understating anthropogenic influence. Well, here we had a whole laundry list, several cases. This, first of all, we said that the poleward migration of the latitude of maximum intensity, uh, uh, the balance of evidence suggests that it has an anthropogenic component. Um, the balance of evidence suggests that uh, there's been an increased occurrence in extremely severe post monsoon season Arabian Sea tropical cyclones. This is some work by Hiro Murakami. Um, the balance of evidence suggests there's been a global average increase of intensity of the strongest tropical cyclones. That's the, the work I showed, some of Jim Carson's work I showed earlier. And that the global proportion of tropical cyclones reaching four or five category intensity in recent decades, that that also uh, has a, uh, a, uh, an anthropogenic, uh, detectable anthropogenic influence. Uh, we also, uh, based on some studies of Hurricane Harvey, uh, concluded that the increase, that the, the balance of evidence suggests that there is some anthropogenic influence uh, on uh, Hurricane Harvey-like extreme precipitation events in the Texas region. Um, there are a few other uh, papers that we reviewed, such as increased tropical cyclone frequency near Hawaii and active TCs in the Western Pacific, um, severe decrease in severe landfalling TCs in Eastern Australia. And the last one was we had a balance of evidence that there's been a decrease in global tr tropical cyclone translation speeds uh, since 1949. But since our uh, an assessment was done, uh, some new uh, uh, comment and replies come out on that uh, where we no longer even consider there to be a balance of evidence for this, but uh, but instead there seems to be a, a signal for tropical cyclone translation speed decrease over the continental U.S. since 1901. And again, we just have a balance of evidence that this represents some type of detectable change at this point. We think that uh, 
there's no um, uh, sound reason to uh, attribute it to anthropogenic forcing at this point. And it is a, a uh, finding uh, where the uh, continued study is, is going on. So that's the past. Let's look at tropical cyclones in the past. We also looked at future projections across the different studies to see what the different studies were saying. And of course, some of our confidence in these future projections will be informed by what we found looking at the past for detectable and attributable. So uh, if you look at across all the different studies of how global tropical cyclone frequency will change, this is a histogram of all the different individual results from individual studies, and here's zero. So almost, al almost all the studies are, are projecting a decrease in global tropical cyclone frequency, but there is about 10% about, uh, or so that pro uh, project an increase. And here we see this uh, across in different bases. So we basically had mixed opinion on this because some, some of the authors had more uh, thought that uh, because we had this sort of uh, split of uh, with some models showing an increase that we had less confidence in this uh, than, than before. But most models are showing a decrease in tropical cyclone frequency. But if you, instead of looking at all tropical cyclones, if you look at the proportion of category four or five storms in models, uh, again, we have, um, if you just look at the, at the uh, percent change in the frequency, First of all, of, of category fours and fives, that's here at the upper left. There it's uh, sort of split, models showing both an increase and a decrease, but most of the models showing a decrease are actually lower resolution models. The higher resolution models are tending to show decrease. That's in total frequency. But if you look then at the change in the proportion of storms, so the fraction of storms reaching category four and five, then it's, it's much uh, more consistent across models lower resolution and higher resolution. So models are definitely weighing in that they are expecting an increase in this proportion of category fours and fives. Um, so we have at least uh, medium to high confidence that this will happen uh, with global warming over the coming century because of this strong agreement between models, a, a fairly high degree of physical understanding of why this would be going on and also, we're beginning to see some evidence for it in observations with this uh, balance of evidence for detectable change, though not a, a strong, yet a strong uh, case for detection at this point. This is just a map showing where we might expect this increase in category four or five activity to happen. Uh, most basins, uh, and this is based on some work that we had done in general climate in 2015, most basins showing an increase here with orange red, black colors, but around uh, the South Pacific, uh, or around Australia uh, and, and parts of the West Pacific, it's more of a mixed, uh, mixed signal. Uh, tropical cyclone intensity. So we were looking at category four or five intensities there, but this is frequency there, but this is intensity. Most models showing an increase. Uh, actually, in this case, all these high resolution models that we looked at were showing an increase uh, at least globally. Um, there are a few examples in individual basins where we're not. Some models are showing increases, but for the most part, models are tending to show increase. And we again have medium to high confidence that this is going to increase uh, going forward based on the high agreement between models, physical understanding, and also the just the beginnings, we're beginning to see some uh, possible evidence for a detectable change going on in observations. The precipitation rates in tropical cyclones, this is the most robust signal we see across all models. Uh, here's the zero line, so all models are very clearly showing a positive change. It tends to average about 7% per degree Celsius of global warming, so roughly close to the clausius clapeyron the, the rate that one would expect the water vapor to go up. And you see this uh, clausius clapeyron uh, rate is, is pretty close to what happens in individual basins. I don't have time to go into that in detail. So, so anyway, the, I don't want to forget about storm surge. With sea level rise, we do expect uh, higher storm inundation levels on average for tropical cyclones that occur, assuming everything else unchanged. Uh, I talked about tropical cyclone precipitation rates, having medium to high confidence. Those are going to increase. Medium to high confidence intensity is going to increase. 
medium to high confidence that the proportion of tropical cyclones reaching category four and five will increase. Why not high confidence? I think because we're still lacking really clear evidence for detectable changes in these things, even though we have relatively high agreement uh, between models that it will happen. And then it's much more mixed bag for global tropical cyclone frequency and even this polar expansion. Those were less confident about how these will change in the future. Even the total frequency of category fours and fives, sort of mixed opinion on that. It's the proportion of them that we're expecting to increase. So anyway, that was tropical cyclones. So I want to get to the precipitation now and how we look at that. So again, here we would have um, these are regional precipitation trends. So we might, uh, let's say we have a distribution of natural forcing trends and a distribution of all forcing trends. So we're looking for where the trends are unusual compared to the natural forcing, but are over here more like the all forcing distribution. Of, of course, the trends could also be well out beyond the all forcing distribution and I'll show some examples. And these are just our definitions of what it means to be detectable and consistent and so forth. Um, so for temperature, before we get to precipitation, for temperature, basically you have this global temperature signal emerging almost everywhere. These red regions are where we have a detectable change going on at the regional scale based on trends from 1901. This is the observed trend and the model trend from the historical one. And we see that, but if you go to 1980, that was for 1901 to 2010 trends, but if you go to 1981 to 2010 trends, shorter time period. Now the trends, observed trend has much more structure and it's somewhat different from the all forcing ensemble. So we think that there's more natural variability going on from 1981 to 2010 and there's less evidence for detectable human influence. We see these white regions where there's no detection. We need longer records really to see the change in uh, temperature signal. So using this sort of temperature analysis as background this is what happens if you do the same for precipitation, regional precipitation trends. So this is the observed map of regional precipitation from 1901 to 2010. Blue is wetting, brown is drying. And this is the historical, these are the CMIP-5 historical runs. Again, blue is wetting, brown is drying. So we see there's a lot more brown in the historical runs than in the observations. Now this is, uh, so the uh, observations seem to be getting wetter compared to what the models say should have happened. And this is a scorecard here. This is, tells us how these two maps compare. So when you have dark blue shading here, that means that the wetting that's going on in observations is actually stronger, significantly stronger than the wetting that goes on in the models. Uh, and it, the, the observations is significantly stronger than in the models. The sort of blue uh, dotted, the lighter blue is where their models and observations are consistent. And the red is where there's significant drying going on, where there's significant reduction in precipitation uh, that uh, is in the same, uh, same direction as what models say should be going on. So first of all, there's not that much area covered by detectable decreases. It's mainly around the Mediterranean here, this Eastern Mediterranean and Southeastern Europe. Uh, there's little regions on Southwest Australia, parts of Indonesia, parts of tropical Africa. Those I would call sort of drying hotspots that we're seeing in observations. These are where the, the detectable drying trends. So these might be the areas that are, where uh, drought risk may be uh, increasing most substantially. Blue though, we see a lot more blue. So there's a lot more wetting going on. And a lot of this wetting being dark blue is even stronger than in the models. So the models are really having trouble picking up as much wetting as is going on in observations. So the observations are getting wetter a lot more since 1901 than the climate models would have predicted. So this means that I think if you're uh, going forward and looking at future projections, models may actually be underestimating how much wetting is going to go on in the higher uh, latitudes. This is not just the Northern Hemisphere, but even the Southern Hemisphere in Australia region. But it's pretty pervasive where we have data. By the way, the gray here is where there's non-detection, so there's no detectable change. And white areas are where we don't have enough data to do the trend analysis. 
So basically the models are saying, the observations are saying a lot of wetting going on. Our models are having difficulty picking up how much wetting is going on. So um, we can see that sort of in the zonal average precipitation trends here since 1901. The black curve is observations and the orange curve are the models, the different uh, CMIP-5 uh, model zonal mean trends of precipitation, the, the zonal mean of the, trend, of the trends. Uh, and you see how unusual the uh, uh, real world is compared to the models. And it's really on the upper edge of it. So the models are really having difficulty picking up this wetting that's going on in Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere in the extra tropics. This is not as big a problem since 1951. So it's mainly an issue since 1901. And we don't know if it's because the models have problems reacting to the forcing in the right way, or it could be that we are not specifying the forcing correctly in the models, but there's something that's not quite right looking at historical uh, data for precipitation versus models. Uh, you could look at the same, you can do the same thing from, for trends from 1951 to 2010. Again, you show this pervasive wetting across the high latitudes. Um, you have some problems here, I say problems in, in, in uh, tropical Africa. That's where the observations are getting drier, but the models say it should have been getting wetter. So you see this wetting going on here in the models. Uh, this is the model historical run wetting versus the observed drying. So that's a, that's a problem that models are having trying to represent what's been going on in Africa. But again, we see drying around the Mediterranean and this pervasive wetting in the higher latitudes of both hemispheres. Not quite as bad uh, a mismatch as for 1901 to 2010. 1981 to 2010, looking at precipitation, there's a lot of gray here. So it's just very difficult to find detectable trends when you go to this shorter time period. So that's uh, something to keep in mind when you're looking at relatively short, shorter data sets. A lot of our tropical cyclone data sets only go back to the early 1980s. So you have a lot of trouble trying to find uh, detectable trends uh, on uh, at the regional scale for a number of climate variables. Uh, so this is maybe one reason why we're having so much difficulty with tropical cyclone finding detectable trends because our data sets don't go back uh, that far. So uh, the summary findings for the precipitation trends. Again, the most important thing from the U.S. perspective, I think of these, there's little evidence for significant drying or decreasing precip in the U.S., but there's uh, evidence for these strong increases in mean, mean rainfall over the northern and northeastern U.S. These observed trends are typically stronger than the CMIP-5 model trends. From a global perspective, we see some drying there in the Mediterranean region, northern tropical Africa, and a few other smaller regions, but uh, not as much drying as wetting. And the wetting regions are these extra tropical land regions, parts of northwest Europe, northern Eurasia, in northern Australia, North Central South America, South Central South America, and so forth. So that's what we're seeing uh, much more wetting in, in the observations than the models, uh, at least for the historical period. So uh, finally, I want to take a quick look at some very recent work we're doing on sea level pressure trends, doing the same kind of analysis for sea level pressure. And first of all, this is the expected trend, what we would expect from models, the historical runs from 1901 to 2010, historical. 1951 to 2010 trends, 1981 to 2010 trends, and even the future projection. All of it shows this sort of couplet of these, of these uh, sea level pressure increasing here in these latitudes, uh, but uh, decreasing over in higher latitudes. So basically there seems to be a um, sort of a strengthening of the surface winds here uh, in the deep uh, southern hemisphere. That's the projected change. Now, what what do and that's what models think should have happened what did actually happen so uh this is from the hat slp2 uh data set looking at sea level pressure trends and indeed we do see positive trends in the deep southern hemisphere uh in in the observations similar to uh similar to models uh the models show that that change and we see here in this kind of scorecard but those changes are detectable. So we see strong positive trends, which are detectable. And in fact, they're actually stronger in observations than in the model or, uh, or consistent here. Uh, so um, that's, the main, that's the main signal we see. Uh, what about this uh, 
green area here. Well, that's that's an area where uh, the observations are showing a, a, a decrease, but models are showing increase. So even though there seems to be a detectable unusual compared to natural variability decrease there, the models are not picking up uh, the, the similar sign. I will say that we've been doing some more recent work based on reviewer comments and looking at a different uh, sea level pressure data set, the uh, 20th century reanalysis data set instead of had SLP2. And we do find that there's a lot of uh, difference in uh, trends, uh, especially over the uh, tropical region, even up extending into the northern uh, mid latitudes, differences in long term trends between these data sets. So that raises the question of we may not really have a good, uh, a reliable indication from observations yet of how sea level pressure trends have been behaving, especially in the tropics and, um, and some parts of the uh, mid latitude, surprisingly, because there's so much difference uh, between HAD SLP2 and the uh, 20th century reanalysis. So I'm not going to show the 20th century reanalysis results here. I'll just say that, that what tends to be the most robust change coming out is this deep southern hemisphere uh, change. Uh, but another thing which comes out of this uh, analysis is there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, detectable change going on in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere doesn't seem to be a place where there's a lot of strongly detectable changes uh, in, in sea level pressure. So those are the sort of preliminary analysis of, uh, so again, we would put most, uh, looking forward, we would put most confidence in that, that sort of uh, deep southern hemisphere uh, change, but still uh, stay tuned in terms of of sea level pressure trends in other regions. And this is if you just look at 1951 to 2010 or 1981 to 2010. I'm not going to go into those in detail or the seasonal ones because, uh, because of these uh, uh, issues that we're finding uh, now between uh, different observation data sets. So I just wanted to give some flavor of where that project is going. Um, oops, excuse me, I for some reason I've lost my uh, um, I don't seem to be able to back, oh, I've lost my summary slide. <laughs> Oops. I wonder if I'll be able to pull up that summary slide or not. But the summary, I can just summarize verbally, is that when we look at tropical cyclones, precipitation and sea level pressure trends, it's a lot uh, more difficult to find detectable changes for these and, and not just detectable changes, but also changes which are consistent between models and observations at the regional scale uh, than was the case for global mean temperature. So there's still a lot of work here, I think, to try to um, get to a point where we have a similar, uh, similar confidence in tropical cyclones compared to, um, or precipitation or sea level pressure regional trends compared to the case for uh, regional or global trends in surface temperature. So let me just stop there. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to display, for some reason I wasn't able to display my summary slide, but maybe we can uh, get that going in the, at some point in the Q&A. Tom, did we able to still hear me or? Yep. Yeah. Tom, thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, so, uh, any questions from the attendees? We can give them a few minutes, but I just want to point out that people can either send me their messages in the chat. Um, their questions or they can raise their hand. There should be a little button that looks like a hand right above the chat below the attendees. Oh, we got a question from Dr. Lau, who is now unmuted. Okay. Hello, Tom. This is Bill Lau. Excellent, Excellent presentation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I have a question regarding your precipitation data. Looks like you mainly focus on the long-term record on land-based precipitation. And right. 
For a shorter record, starting from the satellite era, 1981, there are actually pretty good uh, precipitation, including uh, over the ocean and land. So even though it's a much shorter record, but from a detection point of view, it is very important because precipitation uh, changes not only due to uh, um, climate change, obviously over land that impact humanity, but but the real cost is a lot of them is driven by precipitation over the ocean. So you need to look at both. I think even a shorter record, uh, the satellite data actually people have done well on precipitation, showing that there's a very robust, at least a linear trend uh, um, in the 30 some years of record. And actually those trends over the ocean agrees quite well with precipitation prediction uh, by models over the ocean. Uh, so, so I think that is an area which is important. You didn't mention it, but I'm sure you know that that's uh, an important part of the uh, observation con uh, confirmation with the models. Yeah, I'd like to hear your comment on that. Yes, thank you for thank you for that. Uh, I agree. You know, we should uh, to look at the uh, the global um, records of precipitation and from satellites and also other measures like salinity, uh, which mm -hmm. is affected by changes in precipitation over the ocean. I think there's important work being done in those areas. Again, no matter, uh, my my pitch would be though that uh, no matter what data set you're looking at or time period you're looking at, I think it's, it's useful to uh, bring together that data with models in the way I've done here. Mm -hmm to try to say, well, is the change you're seeing actually detectable compared to what we might expect from natural? Is the change you're seeing uh, consistent or not between models and observations? So both that question of consistency and the question of detection, whether it's unusual compared to natural variability, are both, I think, important questions. And 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 we you can use this, uh, I haven't done it, but it is possible to use these same type of methods to look at the uh, global records over this time period, what you what you hear is what you get if you look from 1981 to 2010, mm -hmm. just over land. So what that's showing is uh, a lot of gray. Gray means non-detection. So that means that we have a, a lot of trends going on here in observations um, that they are not. Um, deemed to be highly unusual compared to the natural variability within at least simulated by the models. The other thing we see here is there's a lot of this gray shading, which is actually white stippled. And that it's white stippled if there's a consistency between the models and the observations. So what this analysis is also saying is that even though we don't have very detectable trends here, at least the trends that we have seem to be relatively consistent between uh, models and observations. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that you can't, um, you can't say that they're significantly different. I mean, if you look at these two maps up here, they look something different, but there's also some areas of, 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 of agreement. But so you have this disagreement over say, Southern Africa where the, uh, mm -hmm. my model are saying it should have been decreasing and but but observed are showing increase but uh, what this is saying is that um, the fluctuations over southern Africa are really not uh, distinguishable from internal variability to begin with so maybe it's just a uh, maybe what we're seeing there is just some type of internal variability signal even in mm -hmm. it's not different enough yet to say that models are definitely way off base, it could just be natural variability. But right. I agree, right. you, could, you could go ahead and do the same thing uh, and, I, and probably would be a good idea for someone to do the same kind of thing. Uh, I know you've done some some work looking at the trends in these uh, satellite-based. Right. Yeah, for the shorter, yeah, I agree with you. 
there is no other way uh, than really using this what you call the uh, balance of <laughs> approach for shorter records because there's not going to be highly statistical significant because of shorter record no matter how you look at it yeah but it it can both natural variability and probably global warming signal there even in a 30-year record that's what i'm trying to say and and, and you need a balance of res uh, uh, of evidence from models and from theory and and others in order to come up with some sensible uh, kind of uh, prediction or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the problem is that it really depends on the particular variable too that you're looking at. Because some variables like um, ocean heat content or something like that, it has such a, a high signal to noise that you can find detectable signal even in, you know, in the 30 year record. And so if you go back to like uh, what we had shown for uh, surface temperatures, there are some regions of the globe which have uh, detectable changes in surface temperature, even over a relatively short record. We even did this for uh, wet bulb globe temperature. And during the summertime, I didn't have time to go th through this in my talk, but this is this, there's a, uh, in some ways the wet bulb globe temperature increases are even more detectable than surface temperature increases. And these only go back to about, uh, I think 1978. So relatively record, but still strong detectable changes in wet bulb globe temperature during some even though it's relatively short record but then if you go forward to precipitation uh you see it's 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 noisier it's hard to find that signal so it really depends on the particular variable what the signal to noise characteristics are i think correct yeah yeah another variable that we've looked at is also relative humidity metropospheric relative humidity actually it's a pretty good indicator of dryness because precipitation, if it don't rain, it doesn't rain, you don't know how dry it is. But relative humidity does tell you how dry the atmosphere gets. Yeah, so that's another indicator, yeah. Well, I, I think that they both have some utility, but I think that the um, this precipitation, one thing that it, it has, uh, one reason why I think it's so important to, to look at is because of its linkage to drought, mm -hmm. flood potential real impacts over uh, over land regions which is one reason why i focus so much here because i think it's a real question uh how drought is going to play out under global and i think that one thing that comes out of this kind of analysis is that it's definitely looking uh very dry around the mediterranean region mm -hmm tropical Africa and some other sort of scattered regions around the globe. And I think that each one of these regions you can kind of identify here, whether it's in Southwest Australia or even Southwest, uh, uh, this little dot here in Southwest Africa, or even along the coast of Chile, uh, they're Caribbean. These are places where uh, there are papers indicating there, there's drying going on there. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and precipitation decreases. So even though these look like small regions, they can have uh, you can have uh, significant societal impacts emerging from these uh, drying regions. Uh, but it's the big picture, I think, in the in the in the higher latitudes, is this, is this really strong moistening going on. And so I think it's an interesting question: why models have seem to have trouble picking up as strong moistening as what we actually see in the observations. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Adler also has a question, so I'm going to unmute him now. Uh, hi, Tom. This is Bob Adler. Uh, that was a great talk. And actually, you've already spent uh, some time talking about precipitation because of Bill's question. Uh, our, our group is, or one of the groups, looking at global precipitation changes and uh, using ocean and land data during that recent period, like the 1980s and the present. And, um, one of the things I've been struck with was, in some sense, how poor uh, the CMIP uh, projections or the ones you projected models during this historical period, 1980 to the present, how poorly they actually do over ocean and to some extent over land, uh, like you uh, saw. But if you look at the AMIP uh, versions of those models, they do a lot better job. And it seems that a lot by the changes in temperature. Any 
comment on that kind you're, of you're breaking up a little bit. I didn't hear the very end of your comment, but I, I, I got to the point where you were saying the AMIP models do a better job. Okay, I was going to, the AMIP models during the historical period, uh, 1980 to the present, do a much better job than the uh, free running models during that period, even though they're obviously have the, they get about the, uh, the right temperature change, temperature increase, but they don't get the pattern of precipitation change uh, well at all. Whereas the AMIP models that are forced by the observed FFPs seem to do a much better job. Do you have any uh, comments on that? Yeah, and that's not too surprising to me because I think if you look at like uh, the period 1981 to uh, to 2010 in surface temperature, uh, you know the um, it's uh, there's an indication here that the observed trend looks a lot different from the CMIP 5 all forcing ensemble trend. To me, that's an indication that there's probably some strong internal variability uh, going on. Here during this time period, and so, uh, and that may be driving the this internal variability signal may be driving the uh, precipitation uh, change to some degree. So it's not over that time period. So it's not surprising to me that if you take AMIP models, they do better uh, than models uh, with just uh, just using um, uh, external force because the AMIT models have the internal variability, all the timing and pattern of it and so forth, the sea surface temperature field is all specified. So you're providing a lot of information there for those models to work with in trying to uh, generate the proper <coughs> pattern and rotation change over that time period. Um, so it's surprising to me then that um, uh, that you can do better from 1981 with the, with the AMIT models. But I will say that Speaking of AMIT models and precipitation, that we we tried to use uh, at least the GFDL uh, AMIT type simulation to see if we could solve this problem of why the models weren't simulating enough change, enough increase in the high latitudes over the century. So this is 1901 to 2010. So we realized that the all forcing the uh, models, uh, which have you know of course random internal variability. They weren't doing it, but we thought, well, let's let's look at uh, an SST force version of the GFDL AM3 model and see if we can do a better job of simulating what actually happened in the GPCC uh, data over the whole century. And that's this set of experiments here. So the uh, the black curve is observations. That's our target. This is our big change in high latitudes over the century, and the uh, the red uh, curves here, CM, CM, GFDL CM3 all forcing model. So you see it doesn't really do a very good job. Maybe it's kind of at the edge of the distribution. And then the blue curve is if you take the uh, GFDL AM3 model with specified SSTs. So you see that doesn't really uh, help you here in the Northern Hemisphere. In the, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, it actually is sort of uh, over uh, overcorrects, I guess, in some ways. So maybe it's doing something important there. But um, yeah, uh, I think I think it is a good idea, you know, also to look at AMIP, AMIP runs to see how those do. And I'm not surprised, you know, especially over that short time period when the sea surface temperatures are suggesting there was a big internal variability signal. I'm not surprised that you can use AMIP models and do a little bit better on the precip uh, because you know these. Again, these climate models, the historical runs just have random realizations of internal variability going on in them, which has nothing, no, no linkage to observed timing of internal variability events. So you, you expect them to do a poor job at simulating any type of natural variability signal in recent trends. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why I think um, sometimes looking at trying, trying to go back to 1900 and do the longer term trends. So you get a kind of a smoother, uh, some of this internal variability get, kind of gets averaged out. Because if you, if you look at our uh, maps of uh, observed uh, surface temperature trends and modeled surface temperature trends since 1901, they're pretty similar. It's a pretty bland field. 
in some ways, we think this is probably the best, this is a pretty good estimate of what the greenhouse warming signal actually looks like in observations because it's so similar. It's a fairly bland field and so similar to observations. That's if you go 1901 to 2010. So a linear trend analysis does a pretty good job of picking up the green, I think, over that long time. But 1981 to 2010, here comparing the observations to models, you know, this historical uh, model simulation is not doing a very good job of picking up the structure. That's probably because it's a lot of, there's a lot of internal variability going on there. And models are going to have a hard time picking that up unless you're using the end up type of uh, design. Yeah, well, thank you. Any other questions? Do you have some tech questions on your end, Daddy? All good from here. Okay. So I think uh, let's ramp up. And I want to thank the speaker for his um, excellent presentation. And also, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, again, we will um, put our schedule um, current on our website. And I look forward to seeing you in our next seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.